Hi everyone, I'm thriller author J.F. Penn and today I'm here with Joanna Evanstein. Hi Joanna! Hello! <laughs> Hello! So just as an introduction, Joanna is a multidisciplinary artist, an author and designer, as well as the founder of Morbid Anatomy blog and the library, and is also now the creative director of the Morbid Anatomy Museum in New York. So exciting! So Joanna, tell us a bit more about you and your background, as you seem to be just doing so much. <laughs> sure, I mean there's no easy way to explain what I do, I think. People ask, are you an artist? I, I don't know what I do. I, I make things. So I got into Morbid Anatomy actually as a total kind of a fluke. I was a photographer at the time. I was doing graphic design for a living. And I met this curator at a medical museum who invited me to do an exhibition about medical museum photographs that I'd already been collecting. So when I got that that gig, I thought, well, if, if this is really going to be a proper exhibition, I should actually go back and reshoot some of the stuff I've already shot and go to all the museums that I think are the very best. So I did a lot of research and I started to collect materials and I ended up going on a one-month pilgrimage to what I considered to be the great medical museums of the Western world. So I went to La Specola in Florence. I went to Paris. I went to London, the Hunterian. I went to Edinburgh. I went to Vienna. I went all over the world, basically, and, and throughout the United States as well. And the blog, to me, was really just my way of starting to organize all the material I had collected. So before then, there was not even a place where you could find all the links to medical museums. So I was using these links again and again in my research and all of these online exhibitions about anatomical art. And then the books I began to collect through speaking to curators and, and getting deeper into the research. I started bibliography. And then I just started doing posts, and it honestly never occurred to me that anybody would be interested in this besides me. I really didn't. I know it sounds foolish now, but it was just something I did. It was like a process-based artwork in order to, to figure out what I really wanted to say about this incredibly rich stuff that was really, really hard to wrap my head around. Um, and then, you know, pretty much from the very beginning, you know, I linked to my three other, three other blogs I liked in the world, and then they... They linked to me, and it, I didn't know how these things happened, but things snowball, as you as you know, very quickly on the internet. And before I knew it, um, there was a following of people, and I was getting emails from people all over the world saying they had never known there was anybody in the world interested in this material either. So it was really, really a wonderful thing. Mm, I know it's fantastic. And for anybody who doesn't know the blog, um, some people might not t tell us because it's not just medical specimens anymore, is it? Tell us a bit more about all the kind of topics you cover. Oh, yeah. So basically, the blog has gotten to the point where I, I just write about anything that interests me. So I can I can when I think about the categories, I think about the library. So a couple years after I started the blog, I started the Morbid Anatomy Library. And when I look at the shelves and the division of shelves, that helps me kind of again understand what it is I'm interested in. So here are some of the topics I would say you would find on shelves and on the blog. 19th century hysteria, the uncanny, art and anatomy, death and culture, um, collectors and collecting, sexology, um, freaks and monsters, uh, art, um, Baroque art in particular, um, Gothic literature, um, history of medicine broadly considered. And then we also have now uh, you know, we, we've also started to collect artifacts. So we have the books, we have moulages, we have lots of taxidermy books on taxidermy. Um, how to explain all that in a nutshell is difficult, and we've been struggling with that with the museum. But I would, what we're trying to say, what, what I think works for me is these things that fall between the cracks and also these things that flicker on edges is how I would describe it. These things that um, are confusing in a delightful way to certain kinds of minds. I think certain minds don't like that kind of confusion, but to me, things that flicker on the edges of categories I find thrilling, and I think all of the things I'm interested in flicker on the edge of categories. Yeah, and I, I felt also like I was kind of coming home on your site. I'm always, whenever I go on there, I'm like, oh, this is so cool, and this is awesome. And I stumbled upon it when I was researching uh, my book, Desecration, um, which opens with a murder in the Hunterian, and has a uh -huh. lot about medical specimens and monsters, um, you know, teratology, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And I was just like, wow, this is this is so kind, this is so cool. And I, I feel, I now say, you know, you're my kind of weird, you know, the blog is my kind of weird and, and which is, which is amazing. So why, why do you think, why do you think some people feel uncomfortable about some of this stuff? Like particularly yeah. I've, uh, people say that the topics of my book desecration are um, confronting is the word that they use. What, why do you yeah. think people struggle with these topics? I think there are a few reasons. I think first of all, um, I think right now, at least in American culture, I don't know how much this is true British culture, but death is the white elephant in the room. It's the thing that people are pretending not to see. And it expresses itself in certain ways. It can express itself in horror movies or CSI TV shows. But there's really no 
dignified discourse about it. And, you know, for example, my whole life I've been called morbid, which is and why I called the blog Morbid Anatomy. I felt like I kind of wanted to reclaim this idea because to me, for the longest time, I just said, oh, maybe I am morbid. And then I, I really began to think about it. And as I traveled through Europe for the first time and saw all of these fine art representations of death, it really blew my mind. When I was 16, this is kind of the turning point for me. And I, I, growing up in California where everything's very laid back and cool and optimistic, I was really drawn to 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 images of, of things that weren't optimistic. Even when I was a child, I, I really loved books in which the main character died. And what I would say is because those things elicit great emotion, um, a real emotion. And I, I don't think, honestly, my new working theory is I don't think people really want to feel great emotion. I think um, it it's confronting. These things can be called confronting because they're, they're, they're emotional and they, they, they kind of overcome our rational mind. And I, I'm kind of bored, I shouldn't say I'm bored with the rational mind, but I, I don't consider myself a rational being. I mean, I, I have certain, I can be, and I have certain things that are rational, but I'm actually much more interested in things that are not rational. And I think mm. death is an important topic that's not being dealt with. And the other thing I would say is, you know, going back to these things that flicker on edges, I think what that really does is it challenges the very notion of, of how we think about the world and, and the fact that humans are meaning-making machines that are imposing these these meanings on things all the time. And these things that flicker challenge that. And I think there are certain people creatives perhaps and maybe others who find that thrilling because it's a sense of possibility and it's a it's just a delightful feeling these things that are so confusing that you realize you know for example when I look at the anatomical Venus which is one of the central objects as you, you know from the anatomical theater uh, uh, I see it flickers on so many edges to me there's life and death there's religion and 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 medicine there's sex and edification all of these things and to me when I follow those, when I try to examine that flickering and I think about why, I think, well, at the time that this Venus was made, you know, my background is history, so that's how I think about it. At the time that this Venus was made, those divisions didn't exist. So our mind actually just doesn't know how to deal with it. In the 18th century, no one was saying, this is bizarre. You know, people were saying, this is amazing. This is the proper way to teach anatomy. I'd like to take five for my museum. Now we look at that and it seems wrong. And I'm very, very interested in these things that seem wrong to us and mm -hmm. what it says about us and how we've changed as a people, and particularly how when, when it's about death. Because I think death has become this exoticized other that we're very uncomfortable with. And any time death butts up against beauty or intrigue or pleasure, mm -hmm. it, it seems taboo and it really it flickers on edges that make some people uncomfortable and thrills others. If that yeah. makes sense. No, that's great. And I'm, I'm really happy now because um, <laughs> I actually, I've been struggling with my branding for my fiction and I've now settled on thrillers on the edge. Nice. So I, I really, on the edge. <laughs> flickering on the edge. <laughs> so I'm really excited because I, I feel that I feel like I want to always be on the edge of what's kind of slightly unacceptable. Um, but it's yes. interesting. Like you said, people call you morbid and people have always called me an old soul. Do you get that? Yeah, I get that too as well. Um, when I'm not getting morbid, uh, it depends. I mean, I, I think yes, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, well, my so kind of follow up question is, you know, um, the other thing I get is, oh, but you look like such a nice, normal person, and you're so happy and upbeat. How can you write yes. about such dark things? Why don't you write about happy things? What mm. What do you say when people tell say that to you? Well, to be honest, people often don't say it to my face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read it in my press. That that's really no one ever says that to me. But often that will be the lead for an article. Like they'll really emphasize that I'm like blonde and smiley yeah. and I, it, nobody says it to me. I mean, people ask me a lot of questions, but it's not exactly that, you know, it, they'll, they'll, they're curious why I'm interested I, and they try to get at it in an oblique way. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think people don't say it to me in so many words. I don't know what I would say in return. I mean, I think I'd say what I'm saying to you, which is, um, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't think about death. Like this is the greatest human to me, the idea that you wouldn't, be concerned with death or really think about it. I mean, to me, it's the greatest human mystery of all. Everybody dies. Everyone who's lived has died. We have no idea what it is. Mm. And, and it defines our life. Our relationship to that defines our, our time on earth as long as we have a limited time on earth. So to me, it's the most profound and interesting and intriguing and worthy of thought thing I can imagine. And I think there's something really honestly morbid about not thinking about it. And that's kind of what this project is trying to say by showing this preponderance of historical um, iterations of people dealing with death in various ways that all look bizarre to us today because we have none. I, I'm hoping on one level, I mean, this is one thing the project I would like it to do is make people just think, oh, that's interesting. Like, why does this seem so bizarre to me? Why, why am I in a room surrounded by 
paintings and photographs and moulages and all of these things that deal with death and beauty in various ways and they all seem utterly bizarre to us today. Mm. Yeah and I mean the objects are very cool and I used an anatomical Venus in my story as like a clue oh, that's excellent. Um, which you know is kind of the basis of it and you're right in England and in Europe we have a lot more of these objects just hanging around um, you know and I wondered of, of your collection now um, you know what are a couple of the really cool things that you have that still kind of delight you um, or things that you're craving that you'd love to get a hold oh. of? Well, the thing I'm craving that I'd love to get a hold of is an anatomical Venus. Oh, uh, okay. But they're really precious, set. aren't they? They're expensive. Yes. I've never seen one for sale and it wouldn't have to be one of Clemente Sassini's 18th century ones. There were 19th century iterations and they do float around from time to time. Um, the other thing I'm considering is I have a friend who is a wax worker who taught herself the antique methods and uh, commissioning her to make one for, I have a beautiful vitrine that a skeleton lives in right now and I think it would be a perfect place for a wax Venus. So I, wa waxes in general are, are one of the things that are really close to my heart. When I think of what I'd like to acquire, it's wax models. Mm. I don't know why. Those to me are this perfect marriage of of, of death and beauty, of, um, of real and idealized, of sex and death, all of these things in one thing. So that would be the one thing I would love. Mm -hmm. um, some of my favorite things in the library right now, some of them aren't even so beautiful, but I have this beautiful, to me, it's like a little model of a, it's a very, it's a folky looking model of a little man on a, on a beastie and I bought it in Korea and it's a Kokdu doll and basically these are dolls that they would put on funeral beers and the dolls would represent different spirits that would, that would assist you in various ways in your journey through the underworld, your 42 day journey and they might be musicians, they might be defenders, they might make you food, um, they might entertain you and they were seen very much as embodying these souls, not even representing but actually containing them or, or being them, I suppose. And I found one of those at an antique store. And it's not one of the things that people really notice in the space. There's many more charismatic objects. You know, I have a full-size skeleton in a case, which is one of most people want to take a picture of that. I have a two-headed duckling that my father gave me for my birthday that everybody wants to take a picture of. They're very charismatic things, but to me it's the more subtle things. The Coke Doodle. I do have a leg moulage from the um, Deutsche Hygiene Museum workshop, which is one of my prized possessions. Um, I have, actually, you probably met Eleanor Crook in London, mm. or you know her. I took a class, she put a class on for me when I was in London of moulage making and the piece I made in her class is actually one of my favorite things. Um, she taught us how to make stubble and how to do color and, and insert hair and it's it's one of my favorite things. Oh, that's so cool. And, and this is, I think this is what's so great because I, I live, um, I guess, location independent life so I don't collect objects but yes. I, I kind of, I feel your fascination and, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the anthology. So tell us, tell us, what you know, what, what is the anthology all about because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited yes. about that. The anthology is uh, it, the anthology is kind of an incredible thing to me. You know, so we many years, you know, for the longest time, for about five or six years now, I've been hosting these lectures in London and in New York and in other places. And my friend Colin Dickey, who wrote, you might know, he wrote a book called Cranioclepti yeah. and another book called Afterlives of the Saints. And he, I met him when I invited him to come speak at our space and we became friends. He kept coming back. He's from California, but he lives here now. And one day we were having lunch and he said, look, I think there should be a, a book of some of these lectures. It's such a shame. There are people all over the world who, who would like this material and it, they, they're ephemeral. And of course, I'd thought of that before. My background is book design. My background is publishing. But to me, it was in, there were certain insurmountable problems, like how do you pay for it, for example? How do you print it? I didn't, I've never done these things before. And Colin basically came in. He said, he, I think we should do it, and here's how we're going to do it. We'll do this on Kickstarter, and then da-da-da. And he was my perfect partner in this project. It would never, ever have happened without him. I would have thought about it, but never finished it. Because it's a, as you know, when I think when I met you, I was deeply immersed in it. It was a full year of, of hard work to get this thing done. Um, that said, it's kind of an incredible thing. I hope you'll agree. I mean, it seems immodest to say, but it's it's kind of, to me, it's like the blog. I, I Because we were self-published and we raised enough money to make it a beautiful object, a covetable object, we were able to make this book exactly the book that I want. And I hope you will find it's the book that you want, too. So it's 500 pages. It's 28 essays, full color throughout. Um, the the people the combination of the people within is is really interesting as well. There's you know people like Simon Chaplin who's the head of the Welcome Library and Kate Ford who's a curator at the Welcome as well uh, from the exhibition I worked on with her about anatomical models. There's um, a piece by our taxidermy teacher which um, is kind of about the the phenomenon of anthropomorphic taxidermy. There's a piece of, from a bookbinder who lives in the neighborhood who he did a lecture on books bound in human skin. There's there's um, 
there's pieces on everything from 19th century hysteria to spiritualism to uh, Frederick Reusch to um, 18th century anatomies to anatomical models to cabarets of death and fin de siècle Paris to diableries to um, even how you would want your body buried today and the idea of mourning. So it's it's very idiosyncratic. It's the topics that people who read morbid anatomy will be well familiar with, but it's it's also what struck me when I was reading it and beginning to lay it out and think about groupings is it's much more than the sum of its parts. And when you read them together, it, it has become something very different. And certain themes that I never even suspected began to emerge. Um, most notably, uh, this idea that's summed up really beautiful, beautifully in, in one of the first essays by Mel Gordon, which is about this old memory theater in a uh, Renaissance memory theater that no one has, no one really understands what it was. Mm. Um, this idea of this, and you might understand this as well in your own work, the siren call of the past and yet the impossibility of ever, ever, ever knowing. And so I'd say all but one essay in this personify this in some way or another, this, this, this obsession, this, obsessive need to time travel through scholarship, through art, um, and to try to access the mind of the past. To me, And I, I really, really felt that when I read these pieces, especially in Mel's, but it was a, a, a thread that ran throughout that I never suspected was a thread in my own thought or my own interest until I saw the book that I curated, if that makes mm, sense. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really fat. And then certain things just come up again and again, which is really interesting to me. Like Walter Potter comes up in, in several, like maybe four or five um, Spitzner's wax models comes up again and again. Uh, Frederick Reusch comes up again and again. So there's there's very literal themes that run throughout, and there's very figurative themes. And um, I don't know. I find I, I find it utterly fascinating, and I I can't wait to see what other people think. Um, I'm just so curious. It, to me, it's much like the blog, and much like everything else that we've tried to do, or I've tried to do. I'm just trying to make the perfect thing for myself, and. Mm. I have the faith that there will, it will speak to others because of that. Um, it is kind of a bizarre flowering, but it's, the, to me, the perfect kind of bizarre flowering. It's a beautiful thing that has a sense of humor but takes itself very seriously at the same time. The scholarship is real. The voices are different. Some are scholarly. Some are not. Some, are, um, some people are amazing writers. Some are not. And I, I really wanted that mix, too. Colin and I both felt very strongly we wanted to keep the voices. And that's one of the, the real strengths of the Morbid Anatomy Lecture Series, in my opinion, is it mixes what I would call rogue scholars with, with museologists, with artists, and all of these voices. Mm. Some are more skilled than others. But I, I like that. I mm. want some to be more skilled than others. I like the, the texture and the difference and the the democracy of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I love your live events. Um, obviously, you're in America right now, and I'm in London. Um, and I, I came along to one at the old operating theatre, and it was a death drawing. So the model actually was an anatomical Venus. And actually, that came out in in my book as um, a, a, a stripper at the Torture Garden. I don't know if you know of the Torture no, Garden. No, I didn't know that. That's yeah, cool. so that I, but seeing her standing there, you know, kind of naked, but painting in, it painted as the on, anatomical Venus, that was kind of awesome. So I wanted to ask you, because I think that the challenge I have is people say to me, well, aren't you writing horror? The stuff you talk about, isn't that, doesn't that fall in the horror camp? But I don't find, like that event to me, there was nothing no. horrific or, you know, and you talk about academics there. These are not, you know, the, these are not kind of horror events, are they? So um, how do you, how do you class the events you do? Uh, to me, it's, it's events like like writing or blogging. It's like a form of inquiry. It's it's about learning things, and it's a it's about learning things with pleasure. And I feel like I think part of the reason people start to try to push it into saying it's horror or this or that or subcultural is that again, this is an edge people aren't comfortable with. This edge of of spectacle and pleasure with learning. And and part of what I'm trying to do through Morbid Anatomy and what I want to do through the museum and what I want to continue to to encourage other museums to do is not to not th not to throw the baby out with the bathwater as it were, not to discard the idea of seduction and pleasure. Um, I think you I think there's a lot of distrust of pleasure. And pleasure is how you entice people to learn in my opinion. And excuse me, I think about that with the blog a lot. Uh, my blog is image driven. I won't do a post unless there's a strong image because first of all, I'm a, I'm an artist, I'm a visual person, but also because I think you have to give someone a reason to read and a vision, an, an image is the seduction that then makes them want to learn. So I think, I think what confuses people about events like that is it's both popular and scholarly and people, that's a division in our culture that, that has been encouraged by academia to its, to its, um, 
it's a detriment in my opinion. You know, I feel like what I've tried to do is discover these academics like that night we had John Troyer and Anna and a marker who are academics who really get it, who are fun and interesting and actually want to communicate communicate their material to a popular audience. Many academics don't think that's very important and don't know how to even if they did. So these are the kind of people I try to bring into our community are people who really know their stuff and really can tell a good story or at least want to engage on a popular level. But I think that it confuses people. Again, it's these edges of what we consider appropriate for scholarship. And when you complicate that, when you throw in some, you know, naked woman dressed as an anatomical Venus, people, again, it starts to flicker on an edge and people just don't know what to make of it exactly. They can they get confused and then just step away. Yeah, which is so fascinating because there was nothing sexual about her or not, and nothing horrific either. It was, it, no. was, it was a fascinating experience. I've never done life drawing either, so I was like, I wasn't very good at it, to be honest. <laughs> First time nobody is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was great. So, so moving on, the museum. So this is very cool, and I'm an active person in the Kickstarter. I'm very excited Thank you. about this. Thank you very Tell much. Tell us about this Kickstarter project and the museum. Sure. So for the last six years, I've been running what I call Morbid Anatomy Library and Cabinet. And it's about a 300 square foot, basically a walk-in closet that I've been bringing people in and making my collection available. Um, last year, right before I left for London, as a matter of fact, I met these two wonderful people, these identical twins, as it turned out, who came to my space. And one of them said, you know, there should be a gift shop cafe like this. And I said, there should be. And I could build you a great museum to go with this. And it should happen right now. And I didn't realize that these are people who just get things done. So before I knew it, they were looking at property and things were being planned. And when I came back from London on, in uh, September, um, this is what I've been doing full time ever since. So we found a space. We're moving from this 300 square foot tiny room with no light to a um, 4,200 square foot um, former nightclub, actually, uh, with roof access. And it's going to be pretty epic and bizarre. It'll, it'll be like the museum form of the book. It's kind of a bizarre flowering. We're making it exactly how we think it should be. Um, the basement floor, the cellar, will be where we have our lectures and workshops, uh, kind of like what I was doing in London, but it'll be able to seat 65 people so we can, we can really accommodate much larger crowds. The ground floor will be a gift shop, cafe, and ultimately a bar when we get a liquor license. And the top floor will be, it's divided into two. Half of that, I guess actually one third of that, is the Morbid Anatomy Library and Permanent Collection. And the other part is a temporary exhibition space. And our first exhibition will be devoted to the art of mourning. And we'll have lots of other things kind of about the topics that are explored in, on the blog. Mm, which is awesome. I think, it, you know, we definitely need one. And I want it in London. You know? Oh, don't worry. I am, that is planned, too. I'm so into starting one. in. But, you know, the thing about London is you guys have things that we don't have here. I mean, you have an embarrassment of riches in London. Yeah, we you do. have the welcome. You have the Hunterian. We have no. nothing. Thing. That's the thing. I'm the only game in town when it comes to this material because, you know, New York is a city of commerce and all of the interesting, quirky museums pretty much get pushed out. It's quite expensive. Like London, it's quite expensive to operate here, but we don't have this tradition of old medical museums and, and a appreciation of history that keeps them from being thrown away. So we do have the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, which is, you know, an hour and a half or two hours from here. But in New York, there's nothing like this. Yeah. So it, there's really, we really, really need it here. But honestly, London is my favorite place in the world. And if I could start a branch there, I would be there in a second. That oh, is well, our plan. You never know. I might put Just my hand up to help with excellent. that. Excellent. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> uh, no, fantastic. So um, can pe people can just find that on Kickstarter by searching Morbid Anatomy. Absolutely. Kickstarter Morbid Anatomy will bring you right there. Brilliant. And where can people find the blog as well? Uh, the blog is at, oh God, uh, blogs http blogspot.morbidanatomy.com I believe <laughs> or if they just put in morbid anatomy, anatomy. Yeah, yeah it's the first thing that comes up for sure yeah it is yeah. and the book is that available on uh, everywhere or just on the blog the book is available uh, in a number of places. The cheapest place to get it right now is to get it through the Kickstarter. So if you get it through the Kickstarter, it's $25. For a $25 donation to our Kickstarter, you get a copy of the book with shipping included if you're in the U.S., $35 if you're in Europe, uh, in England or anything. So that is by far the cheapest way to get it. So if you go to the Kickstarter, make a $25 donation, add 10 if you're from England, you, you get a copy of the book. Cool. That is a brilliant deal. <laughs> Thank you. We tried. We tried. Yeah, so thanks so much for your time, Joanna. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking.